Uh, my name is Matt Boynes, and today we're going to be talking about finding the speed bumps in our code. Before I begin, just a little bit uh, about myself. I'm a relatively seasoned WordPress developer. I've been on it for um, seven or eight years. Uh, I work for Alley Interactive. We are a multi-platform development agency <coughs> where about half of our work is WordPress. Uh, we are one of the WordPress.com VIP partners. And uh, most importantly, we're hiring. So if anybody is interested uh, in a job, please do see me after the talk. Okay. Um, you know, the slides look so much better on a backlit display. Uh, that's a picture of Batman and Superman behind. So the way I see it, there are two kinds of superheroes. There's you know, Superman and Batman. There's having super powers, and then there's having uh, really cool tools and, and grit, uh, and, you know, also a whole lot of money. Um, we, as developers, I think are more like Batman, uh, except because we work with, uh, with open source, you don't need the money. But we do need some cool tools, and for this talk, uh, we, we, we really, uh, need to start off with, just like Batman, a utility belt. I don't think the Batsuit has pockets, so uh, we need something to put our tools in. And for us, that's going to be the debug bar plugin. Uh, just to show up hands, who here has not used the debug bar plugin before? Oh, you people are going to have their minds blown. Uh, and with the debug bar plugin, there are a bunch of add-ons. We're going to use a bunch of those. And honestly, this is all we need to find the speed bumps in our code. Uh, this is between all the add-ons and the debug bar plugin itself, and the debug bar plugin, in addition to being a utility belt, is also going to be um, a. Uh, it, it also has some tools built into it that we're we're going to use. Uh, between the two of these, we are going to be able to pinpoint any issues in our code, any slowdowns whatsoever. Now this talk is about finding the problems. We're not going to be really talking so much about fixing them, uh, but we can do that along the way. There are three general kinds of solutions we're going to look to implement. Uh, the first is if something is broken, we're just going to fix it. That's <laughs> honestly kind of what we hope for because fixing a, a something that's broken is usually a lot easier than refactoring bad code. Refactoring bad code, uh, it can be simple, but it can also be really complicated. You could realize that the way that some data structure is set up is really inefficient, and it means uh, setting up all new data structures and then potentially having to migrate that. So um, number two is what we end up having to do most of the time, but uh, if we can do number one, we're going to try to do that first. Uh, and then the last solution that we're going to try to implement is, add, is to add caching. Uh, I'm not talking about using a caching plugin. I'm talking about um, adding uh, caching within our code. Now, number three is kind of our last resort. Uh, cache is like a magical word. We all want to cache more, and we all want to um, add it wherever possible. The problem with cache is that when it's cold, that is when it needs to be refreshed, so the requests that come in while it's being refreshed are going to be slow. And that can have a cascading effect on our servers, on our, on our website, and really slow everything down. So that's kind of our last resort, but you know what? Sometimes it's just what we have to do. So that's all the preparation we need. Let's dive in. Okay, so... Um, Here's our, our first slow page, and uh, I'm gonna, I probably should have pointed out that I was clicking that link, so I'm just gonna refresh so we can see how long it takes, uh, a second or two, so it's not, it's not so bad, but uh, it's also not great. Uh, let's open up the debug bar plugin and see if it can offer any insight. Now, right away, within a few seconds, we see what the general issue is. On this page, we're running over 1,800 queries, database queries, and uh, that total query time was over three quarters of a second. That is not good. We can do much better than that. So let's try to figure out where these queries are happening, and we can figure out where, where in our code we need to, to go to fix this. 
So as I scroll down, uh, usually when you're going through the queries, the first many queries have to do with just generally setting up the page. Uh, and on a list like this, I find that you can usually go to the middle of the list and figure out where the problem is. You start to see patterns. So we'll just look at query number 189 here. Uh, it didn't take very long, uh, 0.3 milliseconds. Um, and then the next query after it, which is related about the same amount of time, but now the next two are the same kinds of queries, just a different post ID, and the next two are the same kind of queries with a different post ID. And I'm starting to notice some other patterns, which is if we look at, in the debug bar plugin, we see uh, what code is being run to generate this. Uh, we can start to see some patterns in here, too. Now, um, I tend to read these from right to left, uh, or on a small screen like this, I guess, bottom to top. And I go through the functions until I see one that's not a core function. That's something uh, that maybe I've written or, or somebody who's, whose code I'm, I'm looking at has written. Uh, and this is definitely not a core function, especially because it has a uh, prefix. And since we're at WordCamp Boston, this seems like a likely candidate. So I'm just going to copy that to my clipboard, head over to my code. And I'm going to search all my code for this to see if I can go to that function and figure out what's going on. All right, here's the function. Uh, what we're doing here is we're just grabbing a post meta key called related posts. If that's not empty, we're going to, looks like, loop through them. And uh, because we're looping through them as post IDs, we know that this is an array of post IDs. Then for each one, we're going to get the post. We're going to see if it has a thumbnail. And then we're going to store the HTML. Looks like then we randomize it, uh, our, our final array. And then we output. And uh, it looks like we are outputting uh, three of them. So none of this code looks too alarming. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, the, the one unknown that we have at this point is we don't know what's in this meta key. So let's hop back to the site. I'm going to do edit page to see if that sheds any light on the topic. And we'll scroll down and here are our related posts and oh wow, it looks like there are a lot of related posts here. You know, this is at the heart of it a very common problem, uh, not this specific instance, but the, the gist of it being uh, how many people here have developed a, a feature only to find out sometime later that your client did not use that feature how you intended it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, most of us. Uh, this is a pretty good example of that. Maybe when we developed this code, we thought, okay, well, they'll add like three or four related posts. Uh, we didn't think that they would add hundreds or, you know, how many are here? Maybe like a thousand. Now, we could tell them, hey, don't use it that way. But this is actually really good data if we want to do some sort of um, some sort of post analysis later on to see what posts are are related uh, throughout our our site. So let's let's try to avoid telling the client that this is their problem, uh, and let's try to fix it on our end. So uh, what we're doing is getting a list of IDs, and then for each one, it looks like we're running two queries. We are first getting the posts, and then next uh, we're we're checking to see if it has a thumbnail. That's why we had two queries for each post ID. Uh, it looks like there are probably a few ways that we can solve this problem and which way is gonna be better. I mean, no matter what, this is gonna be a code refactor. Everything works here, uh, so it's not a bug. So we, we do have to refactor our code. Um, how we refactor it is going to uh, really depend on the data set. The first thing I might look at in doing this is uh, running one query to get all the posts, and uh, rather than getting them individually in the loop. In this particular case, because there are so many, we're querying you know, maybe a thousand posts, that's still too heavy. So probably what I would do in this case is, um, well, first of all, we don't need the post object to check to see if it has a thumbnail. So we can move that in here, and that's going to avoid getting the posts, and that's potentially going to cut our, uh, our query count uh, 
quite significantly, we're basically going to remove all the posts that have uh, that don't have thumbnails. Uh, the next thing that we can do here is it looks like we only need three posts, so we can get rid of that array slice. And uh, once we have three, well, I guess we can do it up here. we can uh, break out of the loop and uh, we don't have to process the rest of it. <coughs> so let's just uh, go back, refresh this page and see, uh, see how we're looking. Well, that's significantly better. We got 25 queries and 30 millisecond query time. There are even uh, more optimizations that we can do here, but uh, that's probably good. The only thing that we've lost in this optimization and this refactoring is that uh, now we're getting the same posts, we're not, um, and, I mean, they're, they're coming up in a random order, but it's the same three posts every time. So probably what we can do, oops, is move this uh, shuffle up to here, and now we're gonna randomize the post IDs that we look at, and that's a lot better. So we've optimized our first page, and, um, <coughs> Now, now everything seems to be uh, pretty solid. We dropped, uh, what, what was it, like 1,800 queries off of the page load. I'm sure our database is very grateful for that. All right, let's move on to slow page number two. And uh, so that was pretty slow. Let's open up the debug bar. Now, we're only running 23 queries but our query time is 282 milliseconds. The only thing is, is it seemed like the page took about four seconds to load, so I don't think the database is gonna be our issue here. Uh, the debug bar plugin has a few other tools, but none of them are really gonna help us pinpoint the issue. So let's uh, add a tool to our bat belt here. One of my favorites is debug bar slow actions. Uh, and I'll go through and review all the, all the plugins that we use at the end, so you can jot them down. I'm gonna reload this again, and what Slow Actions does is it collects all the actions that are run during the page and pulls together the total amount of time to run each one. Uh, and by actions, actually, it really means actions and filters. So right at the top of the list here, we see that the content filter took over four seconds to run. Now, our database query time was only 177 milliseconds, so the bulk of what's happening here is not related to the database. Uh, so we can open up this filter and see uh, all the functions that were um, that were added to it, and we can look for things that might look familiar to us. Looks like we have a couple things in here. Uh, add related post to content and post nav. Now since uh, this, um, this particular page is looking at post navigation, I think that that's probably a, a very safe place to start. So, oops. So we can search our code for uh, WCBOS post nav and see what comes up. And uh, let's see, what do we have here? So we're getting a, a tag from post meta uh, that's selected as a primary tag. Then we are uh, creating an array of terms, uh, of term IDs, uh, specifically tag IDs, that are not in the primary tag. So this means that we're getting every tag except the primary one. Then we are calling get adjacent post and using that as the, uh, as the terms to exclude, and then we're outcome. So again, very simple code, uh, nothing too outrageous here, except that we're getting every single tag in the database except one. So depending on how many tags we have, this could be uh, this could be quite heavy to process and 
Uh, that seems like a likely candidate. Let's look at the uh, documentation for get adjacent post. Uh, so we're just hopping into the codex here to, to look at this to see if, um, if maybe instead of excluding all the tags except the primary, we can include just the primary tag. So it looks like insane term has potential, but that, uh, that kind of depends on just uh, whatever the first term is, not a specific one that's selected as the primary. Then we have excluded, and uh, previous and taxonomy aren't going to help us out here. So this is a, a case where we're using a core function that doesn't do quite what we are, uh, what we need to do. I think that in this case, uh, so whoever developed this probably in their development environment only had a few tags and that was never a problem to do it this way. But once the site goes live and they start adding thousands of tags, um, this can uh, this can become a really heavy feature, this uh, get adjacent post. So I think in this case what we want to do is we were trying to bend a core function to do something to do something specific that, that we needed it to do. I think instead of doing that, it's probably best if we just uh, go with a roll our own function to, to build this feature. Uh, I took the liberty of writing it ahead of time so you don't have to watch me code. So I can just take this uh, this function, get adjacent post and tag, and uh, basically what we're doing here is taking a tag ID and we're just grabbing if we want the next or previous post and we can primary tag and uh, so for this one we want the previous and then for this one we want the next and otherwise this is a drop in replacement so with that we should be able to reload this and uh, see if we get better results. Uh, it doesn't really look like it, let's see. Well, there's one more thing going on, which is we don't need this anymore. The, the biggest part of it that was slowing us down, we can get rid of that now, now we're not using it. So let's reload and, oh, that was a lot better. Let's do it again, so satisfying. <laughs> We'll open up our slow actions and we see um, now our slowest action was 31 milliseconds. Uh, I'm pretty happy with that, so I think that we can move on. Before we do, uh, the first two things that we've done in, in both of these examples is to look at the query count and the total query time. So um, it would be nice if we had a plugin that just kind of displayed that all the time for us. And there we go. So now we've replaced the uh, word debug, which is relatively useless, with the total number of queries and the total time it takes to run those queries. With uh, that in our admin bar, let's load page number three. All right, so here we have a list of tags. And of course, a slow page. It looks like we're not running too many queries and the total database time wasn't that high. So let's go back to slow actions and see if we can figure out what's going on there. And in this case, it didn't give us enough information either. Uh, so uh, what slow actions does is for every action or filter, it pulls the total amount of time to run that. And so you may have an action filter, you may have an action filter, but there may be something going on in between the two that we're not tracking. I think that we need to add yet another tool to our utility belt. Uh, this is one, it's kind of funny, I've, I've used similar code to this for a very long time and I've just output it in the page. And last night as I was going over my slides, I'm like, well, that, that's stupid. I should just make a debug bar plugin for this. So uh, this is a brand new debug bar plugin that I haven't <coughs> put up on the repo yet, but I will this week. And uh, basically what we're doing with this one is tracking uh, the, the time of the page load, like, like hitting the lap button on a stopwatch. 
at, at the start of each action. So we get a, a sense of what's happening between actions. So we'll go to action timer and uh, we see the, the time of the page load for every action as it's fired. And we'll, we'll scroll down and we see we start climbing up around here and it uh, looks like we're doing some sort of remote requests. Uh, and each of these are really small, so they're not adding up in the, um, in the actions, or really what's happening is, is the, the slowness is happening between them, uh, so they don't show up there. But we know that this is uh, related. So we need to track our remote requests. Let's add another tool to the utility belt. We'll reload this and see what it says. All right, we found our culprit. So we've run 48 requests through the HTTP API, and the total request time on those requests is over five seconds. So this add-on here looks just like the, the query list where it shows uh, the request that's made and then the, the source of the code that, that ran it. And we can see the first uh, function that's not a core function here is view count. Let's go to our code and uh, see what's happening there. So we're running a, um, a remote request on a, on a specific ID and um, then just returning that value. Really very simple code, there's not too much going on. The problem is that we have a lot of posts that we're doing that for. Uh, now when you're dealing with remote requests, oftentimes what you'll end up having to do is cache because you can't control the remote server. In one area where we actually can take a little bit of control though, is if we're doing, say, individual requests and the, uh, the remote server, the remote service, the API, whatever, allows you to pass multiple values or collect a pool of things. So again, I've taken the liberty of uh, writing this up ahead of time. Uh, so what we're doing here is when the loop starts, we are um, grabbing all of the post IDs for that query, and then we are querying the service for a common delimited list of those IDs. So our uh, remote service allows us to pass multiple IDs, which is not surprising because I wrote it for the purposes of this talk. And uh, then it's saving those in a global variable. And then later on in the code, when we call view count, we're just referencing that global variable. Let's go back here, refresh, and uh, that is quite a bit better. We, our query time is uh, still low. We always like to see that. Let's go to the remote request. And now we have one request, uh, but it, it, it's not altogether fast. It's 100 milliseconds. Uh, in this case, we probably want to add a caching layer on top of that, uh, just to make sure that, uh, that it's always fast. You know, another thing about making remote requests, you should always cache them because the remote service that you're getting data from probably doesn't want you to hit their service with every single page load that you get. Uh, so even if you're just caching things for two minutes or five minutes, uh, pretty much any time you're, you're running a remote request, I would advise doing that. All right, we've got three down, and we've got time for... Uh, for a couple more. Let's go to slow page number four. So here's one where we're showing uh, share counts and we can uh, load up our debug bar plugin as always. Uh, the database queries don't show anything. Slow actions do in this case. Uh, we're dealing again with the content filter and um, we have add related posts to content, nope. WC boss, uh, post nav, nope, that's not related to this. Add share count, that, that's, um, that sounds likely. So let's search our code for that. See what's going on. 
And uh, in this case, it looks like um, we're calling share count. And uh, this is not passing a, a list of IDs, or it's not even passing any IDs, it's just one single request. So let's look at the remote request here. So there's only one request, but it took three seconds. Uh, that's, that's a pretty lousy service right there. We, um, in this case, we probably want to find a different one to use for this purpose. Uh, but we could also just add a, um, a transient cache to it, and uh, that would make things uh, quite a bit easier. Now, in my um, rehearsal, I, I did add this, but it uh, looks like Fortunately, it needed to be refreshed, so uh, I don't even have to uncomment the code. I can just refresh the page. And uh, now we're not making a remote request. Everything is fast. So in this case, we, we had to do our last case scenario, which was add a layer of caching. Uh, and the caching that we're using is transients. Uh, this is a built-in feature of WordPress where you can store arbitrary data. Um, and uh, it's, it's extremely easy to use. Basically, you... Uh, look up a cache key. If it uh, doesn't exist, it will return the Boolean false. And uh, if it does exist, then it'll give you your data. So if the uh, transient is result is false, then we'll go through, collect our data, populate the transient, and then no matter what, return it. Uh, so basically to add transients, you're, you're only talking two, maybe three lines of code and um, and you can really make a, a big difference in, in your page load when you have a, a slow feature like this. All right, moving on to slow page number five. <coughs> now this one's real slow. Uh, again, our, our total database uh, Query time is not very high, and our total number of queries is not very high. Uh, we didn't make any remote requests. Let's look at slow actions. We definitely have a, a good answer here. Again, we're dealing with the content filter. And um, let's just see if the action timer gives us any useful information, too. Uh, no, it really doesn't. We know it's happening uh, somewhere after the post, so it's happening within the loop. That's, that's not that surprising. So, uh, especially because we know that the, uh, that the content filter is where the problem is. So this is an also of interest, uh, could be considered a featured post. We can look for that. At this point, given our, our predictable naming, I'm guessing that the file is going to be problem-5.php. So here it looks like we do have uh, transient caching uh, posts that we're getting. And then after we get that, it looks like we're doing a whole bunch of processing on it. And depending on the size of that that we're looping through, um, and we have loops within the loops here, I think that this is going to require a major refactoring, which I certainly won't bore you with. Uh, depending on the feature, what may need to be done in this case is, so we're, we're getting a bunch of posts and then we're processing them. Uh, we're storing that, the posts in a transient, but um, we could just store the whole lot of it in a transient. We could move the transient processing to, instead of just storing the post objects, store all of the HTML that it generates, and then we could uh, output that instead. In this case, I'd probably say uh, we'd need a, a better refactoring than that. I'm sure that this code could greatly be uh, optimized. It looks like what it's doing is adding the uh, highlighting to the words and, um, that are, are related to this particular post. So uh, there are a number of ways that, that you can optimize it. But again, this isn't a talk about how to optimize your code. It's about how to find the slow points. And uh, that's certainly what we've done here. Uh, we figured out exactly what the problem is, and um, this would be actually a great time to delegate if you have that option. <laughs> all right, uh, that is all I have, so let's open it up for questions. All right, we do have mics set up. If you want to just shout it out, I can repeat your question.
Is there a way to soft expire transients? Uh, so you mean like the transient expires after five minutes, but only in a certain case, only in a certain situation? Yep. You could just return the soft, the, 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 the old value, and then in queue to prawn or something, uh, the update for that. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a great idea. Um, there are, uh, so the, uh, let me repeat what you just said for the purposes of uh, video. What you've suggested is um, rather than uh, expiring a, a transient and then making a visitor wait for a request to be loaded uh, using WP cron or, or, or something else to regenerate that cache value behind the scenes uh, but still serve up the uh, now uh, cold cache, the, the now expired cache value to the visitor who triggered it. Does that sum it up pretty well what you said? Uh, yeah, so the, the general idea that you propose is a great way to go to um, trigger some sort of asynchronous process that will regenerate the cache but still serve up the old one to, to a visitor. Uh, what I typically do in that case, or the way that I typically solve it, is um, to either store two transients, one is information about the original transient, uh, or to, within the transient, store uh, an, uh, an object or an array where part of it is values that you want cached and then part of it is information about that cache, like a status, that it's um, either uh, a warm cache, that it's a, a cold cache and needs to be refreshed, or that it's in the process of being refreshed. And then um, trigger an asynchronous process like you've suggested, uh, and WP cron is, is a great way to do that because you can load up that you need to do this, but it's not gonna add any real load to, to the page. Uh, so then, um, in either case, if you're using multiple transients or within one transient, you're storing, storing the meta information about the transient itself, um, then all you have to do in that request that triggers the, the cron task is to update the transient uh, and say, this is now being refreshed. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool, all right. Any more questions? I'm sure you have them. We all have slow pages. What have you guys struggled with? Well, the fastest pages on the internet are all in this in this room. Kevin, you tips for refactoring, you know, all going through old code and making sure that it's All right, so the question is, uh, do we have any tips on refactoring old, co old code, uh, code that maybe we wrote a couple of years ago and uh, really needs to be uh, uh, rebuilt, uh, maybe with new ideas that we've learned at WordCamps? Um, yeah, definitely. So if we could rewind time or we could change a, a decision now to make uh, future us, uh, uh, make the job a little bit easier for future us, uh, it's to um, add good documentation. Uh, you should always write your code and document it as if the person who has to support it is uh, a, little, uh, a little loose and loves firearms, okay? So we wanna, which may be future us, you know, after, after dealing with, uh, with a lot of slow websites. Um, you know, there, there's really no one perfect answer for what we can do about the code that we wrote two years ago. Uh, honestly, all you can do is pinpoint what the issue is and then, uh, and then you just dive in and um, go through the, the three general solutions that I outlined, look at it and see if maybe there's a bug that we didn't consider. You know, sometimes it's, it can be as easy as like, uh, maybe you added a layer of caching to, to your code two years ago, but there was a typo in your cache key so you're uh, getting one cache value, but then setting another, so it's never getting the the appropriate cache value. Uh, it's always refreshing it, even though when you look at the code, it looks like it, it's cached. It's not. Um, so you know that option, that approach number one. Maybe there's a bug, and 
and, and you can just fix it. Approach number two is refactor, uh, and then approach number three is, is add cache. So um, specifically, how do you refactor code? Well, that's, that's specific to the situation. Did I dodge that answer that question properly? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's certainly uh, so yeah, um, the the add on to that is deprecating your old code. You know, that's one of the big challenges to WordPress, but it's one of the things that makes it great is supporting um, is backwards compatibility and supporting old, old code. Uh, but there's nothing stopping you from writing new code and then just maintaining support for the old stuff uh, and adding that deprecation warning to it. Uh, so with WordPress, you can indicate that a block of code is deprecated and it fires a, a PHP notice saying, hey, this is deprecated, you shouldn't use this if a developer is using it. Any more questions? I think we're all just ready for lunch at this point, right? Another question. What sort of overhead does the debug bar add to your analysis? Like, you know, are you creating more uh, queries? And is, does it not count those? Does it show you as possible? Yeah, so the question is what kind of overhead does the debug bar plugin add? Uh, it certainly adds some, especially with regards to uh, memory, because um, uh, everything, like this, when we look at a, uh, a the list of queries, that's all being stored in memory to later be output. Uh, so it's it's certainly adding some overhead to that. Most uh, debug bar plugins will not add any queries to the database. I've never seen one that does, but I'm, I'm sure that there are. Um, so the, the main overhead is, is really related to memory considerations. Um, it's, uh, it's not, Sometimes it's going to be fairly insignificant, but if you have a, a real problem, like you have a couple thousand database queries happening, it, it could actually be a little significant. Uh, but at that point, <laughs> I think it's the least of your worries, uh, and it's going to help you pinpoint the issues. Now, it, it is worth noting that uh, I wouldn't recommend running the debug bar plugin on a production environment uh, unless like something's going on. You just need to activate it real quick, take a look at what's going on, and then um, and then quickly disable it. Uh, and it's also worth pointing out that the debug bar plugin is far more useful if you enable uh, debug mode and enable the save queries uh, constants in your WP config file. Um, I think on the debug bar plugins uh, plugin page or installation page, uh, it points out those two constants that you should put to your config file. So those are two constants that in a production environment in where your, your website's running live, you probably don't want to have those enabled. Um, so, you know, just use it for the purposes of debugging and it, it probably won't get in your way. Any more? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what if your, your administration panel is slow and, and uh, it, the issue isn't with your, your front end? Uh, all the same principles can apply, because um, the, the debug bar plugin works in the back end as well. Uh, and we can go through and, and look at what's happening there. Um, for the most part, I, I would say that if you have slow pages in the admin panel, they're probably custom, either through a plugin or a theme. And so, um, and, and not related to one of the core pages. As somebody who works with large data, I mean, this, um, this particular database that I loaded in for, for this site, uh, I think has over a half million posts and the uh, admin panel is quite zippy about, process, about working with it. So if you have slow pages in the admin, it's the exact same principles because you're probably dealing with custom code that's slowing it down and uh, you can use the exact same approaches to pinpoint what those issues are. Yeah? Ah, AJAX requests. So how do we debug slow AJAX requests? 
that is significantly trickier. Um, what I typically do myself, so the reason why it's trickier is uh, we can see, like through Chrome's develop, uh, web dev tools, that a request is slow, but an AJAX request doesn't have the debug bar, and an AJAX request queries and everything aren't gonna show up in the debug bar. Uh, so uh, what I typically do personally is just copy code from a debug bar plugin and paste it into my AJAX <laughs> response and uh, output the, the same data there so that I can at least flip through it because the, I mean, the, the debug bar plugin is really flashy, it's, it's really nice, but the, the important bits about it are the data and that we can output in, in any request. So that's what I typically do. Uh, does anyone else have a have a better answer to that? Yeah, that's it. That that is a great idea. So he suggested using a service like New Relic to um, track those requests. It's external, it's tracking basically all the same information, uh, and you can even use um, New Relic's, um, you know, basically their, their API to add information um, to what it's tracking. Uh, so you can basically track all the same stuff through an external service and look at it that way. That is a much better answer, good job. Any more questions? All right, well thank you all very much. Uh, so here